Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, JPG, D, 5, 8. Initiate, part 2. I think archetypes help with that, of making sure that, especially in a game like Masks that relies on these archetypes so heavily, those archetypes are designed less around specific powers. They're designed around what story do you want to tell, which is part of what I love about Masks as a game and part of what is wonderful about this genre, I think, and the way it uses archetypes. Because other tabletop RPGs that you look at, a lot of more famous ones, it's like you pick what character class you're playing based on what abilities you want to have. Do you want to have magic? Do you want to have a sword? Whatever it is, and then you go from there. Whereas Mask says, what kind of story do you want to tell? Do you want to tell a story about someone who is always on the outside of situations? Do you want to tell a story that has to do with family? Do you want to tell a story that has to do with discovering what it means to be a person? Uh, and then gives you the tools within that narrative to go, here's how you do that in a teen superhero story. And I think that is amazing and wonderful in the way that this game functions and the way that archetypes in this game function. Uh, jumping a little bit back into Young Justice, what yes, was an archetype... Please. Oh, no, please. <laughs> um, what was an archetype that just outright just pleasantly surprised you or shocked you or anything like that? And and please feel free to use all three seasons on this one. <laughs> so I love how you're asking the questions now. When did that happen? <laughs> Honestly, I, I do this all the time <laughs> on, on other people's shows. It's OK. We're getting the, we're getting back on track. Yes. Just, yeah, and this okay. is how our Shadow and Bone podcast is going to be also. <laughs> this is how... You know, we're just going to help each other because that's what our archetypes do, Emily. So, so I'll throw this question back at you in a second. But for Please. me, um thing I talk about a lot uh, that everyone knows, anyone who listens to the show for more than five minutes knows that I love Miss Martian deeply with my entire heart. Uh, Miss Martian is incredibly important to me as a character. Her tiny little action figure is behind me on my bookshelf right now. Uh, and she's wonderful. And Miss Martian, over the course of three seasons, is a very complex, compelling, multifaceted character who I am deeply invested in at all times. But Miss Martian is very much introduced with the archetype of, like, the girl uh, that was very prevalent in animated media of this time and earlier. Uh, and I and, and honestly, now you know it, we. Animation and action animation especially has gotten a lot better at this, but it does still rear its ugly head every now and then. For people who don't know what I'm talking about, there is kind of a trope in media, uh, especially action media, of like, you have a team of people and you have like your leader guy and your second in command guy and you have the tough guy and the funny guy. And there's the girl whose defining characteristic is girl. Uh, and it doesn't matter what else she is. She's the one girl and she's here and she's going to be a girl. When Young Justice first started uh, and those first episodes came out uh, where we have Aqualad, Kid Flash, Robin and Superboy doing all of this stuff. And at the very end of the second episode, they introduce Miss Martian. My brain uh, being 13 uh, at the time of these came out, 12, 13, whatever I was, was like, ah, here's my one female character and I will love her because she is all I will get. <laughs> and the show wonderfully surprised me and gave me many more female characters as the show went on. But Miss Martian is introduced as like, she is feminine and she thinks with her heart rather than her head a lot of the time. And she cares about traditionally feminine things like baking and cheerleading and flirting with cute boys and presents all of these things. And then as the show goes on, goes, but that is not all she is while also saying those are not bad things for her to be, which is really important to me. I talk about it a lot that I am one of those people who firmly believes in the idea that being powerful and being traditionally feminine are not mutually exclusive traits. And a lot of media that has the girl archetype either makes her a like strong action girl that relies on C coded masculine traits to present her as not like other girls, quote unquote, mm -hmm. which is its own bag of nonsense to unpack someday. Or it presents her as traditionally feminine and maybe needing to be the damsel in distress or being rescued. Or the third option of presenting a character who is traditionally feminine and over the course of a show 
training that out of her, for lack of a better term, of being like, see, you can't be soft and feminine in this world. You have to be an action superhero and you can't do both. And media has a bad tendency to say you can't be both when being both is incredibly important to me and other people. So I really appreciate as the show went on that as each new layer of Miss Martian's character is revealed and we find out actually she is a character with deeply held traumas and a complicated past and exceptional powers and all of these complicated things about herself, it still says that girl she is at the beginning of the season is not a mask. It is not a lie. It is not something that is wrong with her. That is just part of who she is. And she is allowed to be part of that while also being all of these other things. And so all of that is very important to me about this character and the show in general, because it pre- this show does a lot of presenting an archetype early in season one. And as the show goes on for a lot of characters, exploring that, yes, they are those that bare bones thing of an archetype, but they are so much more and that they are allowed to be both of those things at any given time. So that's the archetype that surprises and makes me the most happy about Young Justice because it's my favorite girl and I love her with my entire heart. Um, I think we should just drop the mic and just end the show here now at this (laughs) point. (laughs) That was incredible, Emily. Thank you so much for that. That was incredible. <laughs> I think deeply about Ms. Martian a lot because I have been caring about this character for a decade of my life now. Is that what it is? Um, but yeah, because if we're talking about characters, as you brought up, like Power Rangers helped you realize what you, you wanted to be and you wanted to be the Red Ranger. Oh, and yes. Things like that. Miss Martian came at a really important time in my life, I think, in a lot of ways because I was the way a lot of nerdy 12 year old girls dealt with in that kind of mentality of like not like other girls and that myth of because I don't like makeup or don't wear pink I am somehow different the than other. every woman mm-hmm. uh even though that is a completely false dichotomy that is presented by media and perpetuated by weird stuff uh, and it's not great and we need to break it down and Miss Martian came at a time in my life when I was dealing with that and gave me this character that was like no you don't You don't have to hate dresses. You don't have to hate makeup. You don't have to hate those ideas to also be a strong, independent young woman. You can do all of these things and no one should ever tell you that you can't do all of those things or that you have to choose between those things and be either this or that. And so that's a whole a whole thing I could unpack more fully someday. But... (laughs) That all of that matters. I don't know where I'm going with this. What's it, <laughs> beyond Miss Martian's important to me for many, many reasons and came at an important time in my life. We all have those characters. <laughs> but <laughs> how about you? You, who is our guest, who should be talking more? Uh, JPG, what is... <laughs> well, these are discussions, not interviews, and we make that very clear. But what is an archetype for you with the show that really... I, I don't expect you to go on a five minute rant about how a character changes oh, no. your life because you don't oh, need no. to if you don't want to. <laughs> but what is an archetype from this show that surprised or impressed or just made you happy to see how it was explored on this show? I, I think too much we focus on whoever is good is handsome or pretty. And that is a positive quality as opposed to whoever is villainous has uh, physical scars or or uh, specific color schemes or uh, an, a non-humanistic look, right? Uh, Fred Bug in the third season is an outright revelation when it comes to that sort of stuff. Uh, we should protect uh, Fred Bug at all costs. Uh, and um, Forger as, as a, not as a human being, but as, as somebody who is sentient, right? Yeah, as a person. Um, there is, yes, uh, they are caring in a world that doesn't teach caring and uh and where his values are are undervalued on his home planet but then finds people in order to nurture that same value uh i i think it's an incredible teaching tool right it's it's forger was never expected to be kind but always wanted to be and knew that there was a there was a specific part 
in his soul that just told him to be kind. Uh, and, uh, um, oh gosh. Uh, but then getting to have Forager look like that. And then with the, with the charm making him, uh, making him chubby, kind of an Asian kid also, which I kind of really liked. <laughs> uh, that was something that I, uh, that was something that I valued as well too. Right. Because, um, it was him. And then who was the other one that they didn't change? I just did a rewatch of Justice League Unlimited, and um, it's the episode where Supergirl goes to the Legion of Superheroes time, and one of the heroes there is Bouncing Boy. Yeah. And they didn't sort of thin wash him into being the thinner guy that can bounce and all that. No, he was just a big guy who was a superhero as well, right? Yeah. Yeah. I love that they turned a lot of those tropes on the on its head, and that's um, that just reminds me what I was what I wanted to talk about next as well, where archetypes heavily archetypes heavily uh, like depend on tropes, right? Yes, yes. But Lord tropes can be negative, like and, and Lord tropes can be built off of ridiculous. Uh, uh, thought processes that just don't really apply anymore. Just like how you were talking about how, you know, the dichotomy between wearing dresses or not wearing dresses and all that stuff too. Yeah. As an Asian American, um, something that I love in storytelling, especially when it comes to Asian Americans, is the idea that we live in two different worlds, right? Um, You can talk to any of your Asian friends or family members and they can tell you always that they're not white enough for their white friends and they're not Asian enough for their Asian friends, but they're too white for their Asian friends and they're too Asian for their white friends. And you're solely placed in the middle. And um, that's any time that I build a Masks character in order to... to uh, and, and I don't know why all these shows let me be on their show in the first place. <laughs> Uh, but everybody that I've built, right? You know, the um, the Unrivaled, for example, in our ongoing quest show. Uh, on Quest of Geek, we have something listed as issues, and they're like special edition issues where we play masks. And I play a character called the Unrivaled. And I based the Unrivaled on how, um, if you're familiar with Jay-Z and Beyonce, they have a daughter named Blue Ivy. How is Blue Ivy going to interact with the world? <laughs> when she is a teenager because on the one hand she is the daughter of two of the richest and most powerful people in the world when it comes to entertainment on the other hand she is black and that is going to dictate a lot of the choices um that she is going to need to make in order to make sure that she personally feels safe and that's what I based the Unrivaled off of. It's, um, you know, I made hit. I always play Filipino characters because you never see Filipino characters. Uh, and, uh, and I based the Unrivaled off of you can have all the money in the world, but you're still Asian. And, you know, and also using the idea because he he is a doomed, which is um, which is a playbook in masks where uh, like you're just you're just screwed at this point. <laughs> like there's something just coming for you. It is the masks playbook uh, for when you want to tell sad boy stories, uh, but it is basically the idea that your superpowers are going to kill you someday uh, in some whatever complicated way that is, whether some entity is going to challenge you, whether your powers just degrade your body over time. It is the here you go. Here's a character. You've been given ultimate cosmic power and something bad's going to happen with it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> and with the unrivaled, his power works off of if he wins against you in anything, he can copy a skill or power that you have. And his doom is a thing called the Delirium Decathlon, which is a 10 sort of Olympic style event where it, the the gods and goddesses of competition can just test you on absolutely anything. And whoever wins gets all the glory and fame and all that stuff. Whoever loses has to be a slave for them for the rest of eternity. And I specifically picked that. I know that you laughed at Delirium Decathlon because it is a ridiculous name. And there's it's a reason why I picked it. It's such a good comic book name. It's such a good comic book name. I named it that because of how, especially how the Asian community feels about being in school and the pressures of testing. And, uh, and that's why, and I remember being an academic decathlon as a kid 
and just the immense pressure of, well, if we don't do this, we can't visit Disneyland. And I lived in a very low income area and it was, this is the only time some of these kids will ever be able to see Disneyland. And that is an insane sort of pressure that you could put right on top of the on, on top of the like the the unspoken sort of racism of like well you're the only asian kid in our group we're just expecting you to be smart at this point and uh and yeah i wanted to play out those uh, you know and and i i think i'm not the only one who does this in the masks community but all of us pick characters in order to play out traumas <laughs> <laughs> that 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 we have personally experienced and even not I think largely across a lot of tabletop RPG things, not even just just not just traumas, but I think so many people use tabletop RPGs as a way to go. Here's a thing I really, really, really want to explore in some capacity. And Mm -hmm. tabletop RPGs give you an avenue to do that. Sometimes it's unpacking. Oh, there's this thing that I have not unpacked and I need to do that in a game for some people. And sometimes it's just a thing that you're like, I need to build the thing I always wanted to see when I was 14 kind of thing in a game. Mm-hmm. But yes, sorry, continue. <laughs> oh, no. Continue I mean, saying that, things That's a great smart. point. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, no, no. Uh, I mean, another example of what you just said is how I built the Steel Spectre on Nerds on a Roll, right? Um, I came into I came into Nerds on a Roll uh, in a very strange sort of way because I played in their second season. Uh, and uh, and it was a fantasy season, but then when we were starting up the third season again, we actually played as a bunch of villains. Uh, so I played a fantasy uh, a fantasy character and then a villain character in their masks universe. <laughs> and then when I finally turned to to Steel Spectre, I'm like, well, what sort of character do I want to play? Right? Like, what what else do I have to work out on this one too? And I picked the Scion playbook, where yes. one of your parents is a villain and a well known villain at that as well. Uh, and I think um, that helped me a lot with the idea that, you know, and the way that Steel Spectre is being played is that his mom is a mercenary. Uh, kind of think of like if she was like the leader to the A-team. I hope that's not too much of a, like, is is that a reference that you get? Because I know that like. <laughs> I, I, I'm cultural osmosis, man. I get the concept. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Cause like you gave you gave me um you gave me blank face and I was like well oh god did I lose her? No, I was, <laughs> it's also the thing where I'm sitting here like yes I listened to Nerds on a Roll I know who your character's mom is <laughs> but also I understand for our listeners at home who may not be as deep into the Nerds on a Roll rabbit hole as I am please explain. <laughs> well you know mom's a mercenary uh, and she can uh, she can like turn into organic steel like Colossus, as opposed to his dad is a very well-known villain, the gentleman Geist. Uh, and he is, um, he can like phase through and, and all that as well. Uh, and so uh, I played it to where um, my mom's a single mom, you know, and my dad popped in and out like a ghost. And that was like kind of the concept. And when, when Lauren and I sat down and really talked about it, we're like, well, I think this is a really good concept because you're, you're, pulling from real life right and i and we do base a Sero who is steel specter's mom uh, off of my own mom uh because lauren got to meet my mom once and uh lauren uh, who's our gm for nerds and roll loves my mom so much now <laughs> and so he like he got the whole she is like okay i know i know how your mom acts this is how i'm gonna act on air like all of this stuff too and uh it was, it was a very very cute meeting between the two of them so so yeah but with that idea of this is just we're just going back and forth about masks Please? and how wonderful yeah. it is um, <laughs> with that idea of bringing in stuff for your own life. When I was making my Protean City character uh, that people have heard me talk about before, Highwire, who is a reformed playbook. She was a former villain uh, turned now superhero t- armed with knives and a lifetime of circus training and just trying her best at all times. Uh, and I love her and I love playing her. Uh, when I was coming up with this character and trying to figure out what I wanted to do with her, one thing that I've always loved about Protean City, the podcast, is that they have put a lot into trying to make their city feel like a diverse and lived in world and having people of so many different life experiences in their NPCs and the way that this their world has developed. And so I had reached out to my the gm for that first episode to brandon and was like 
can I give my char- my character food allergies, which is something that I deal with in my own life and have had my entire mm. life and is uh, just a thing that has a big influence on my life and how I have to interact with people and move through situations because <sighs> uh, it is. It just is. Uh, and I was like, can this be a thing with my character? And can that be a thing that we touch on at some point without it being a very special episode uh, about <laughs> food allergies or being an offhanded joke? Because that was mm-hmm. always what I had growing up seeing food allergies presented in media. It is either a very awful, very painful to watch joke about like oh isn't it so funny this guy having an allergic reaction because he ate a walnut haha and i'm like no that's that's my life that's uh that's you making fun of the idea of me almost dying thanks uh or having like shows that are like we're gonna do a very special episode and spend half an hour only talking about food allergies and i'm like that's not great either um, yeah, and then it never comes up. And then it never again. comes up again. Yep. And their response was, we want to make a comic book universe where everyone feels like they can be part of this universe. And so my weird little thing that like for a lot of people is not an important form of representation, but for me growing up was a very important form of representation, was something that I got to create and include in this character and have come up in organic normal ways that it comes up in my life of people at the it was the first episode I was on it ended with us like after we defeated some stuff and our the main heroes were like hey you want to go have some hot chocolate I had to be like I can't and have that awkward conversation that I've had in my life a million times of being like do you have anything else I want to participate but I also want to not die Uh, and (laughs) how that masks I think lots a lot of people do, masks especially, and I don't know why it's always masks, but it's always masks, lets people explore those things that are important parts of their identity that don't seemingly come up in media or aren't explored in the way that we want to see them explored in media. I have seen many a person talk about using masks as like, masks let, lets me do the teenage experiences I wish I had gotten to do but couldn't because of where I lived or how I was expressing my gender at the time or whatever it might be. And I'm like, that's wonderful that we have this tool and this wonderful thing that lets people do that. As somebody who has a food allergy, I got to ask what it is. <laughs> I am milk, eggs, and some tree nuts. Uh, so Milk, eggs, some tree nuts. Okay, gotcha. Um, something culturally for me, right? Uh, and that has actually come up on Nerds and Roll and, and on, uh, on Quest and everything as well is the idea of food, right? Uh, as a Filipino person, if you have any, a Filipino person in your life, there has been one point where they have tried to overfeed you to the point where you thought you were going to explode. And and it's really something that that is built into us culturally. The more food that we give you, the more, uh, the more we can show that we care about you because food is unfortunately very scarce. Uh, like, you know, where, uh, in, in whatever sort of, uh, um, on whatever island you grow up on or anything like that, right? And, uh, and so, so yeah, so that is something I, I try my absolute best in order to be like, hey, like, what's your allergies? Let's go to this place. Let's go to that place. All that stuff. Um, and if you're ever on the West Coast, uh, I want to, I want to give you a heads up. Um, Disneyland is incredible about food allergies. I'm very aware. I am yeah. very, very aware. <laughs> I have been to Disney World a couple of times in my life and I have had multiple things. I have talked, I have talked in various things over the course of my life. It came up in a class I was in one time about how Disney World is one of the few places I have been able to go and go to a restaurant and get an actual full meal that I have actually enjoyed Mm -hmm. because restaurants everywhere else in the world seemingly don't have the capacity or the inclination a lot of the times to create a safe environment in which I can eat because like even just going somewhere and being like, well, just get a hamburger instead of a cheeseburger. I'm like, they're all cooked on the same grill and it's never cleaned down enough for me to know and be safe and feel safe. And sometimes it's not even a me being an actual danger. It's the feeling of, I do not know if I can trust this place. I do not know if this place is trustworthy enough to not kill me because it is not like a dietary choice. It is a actual life or death condition in which I live and survive. Uh, Mm -hmm. Whereas Disney World, I have told the story before to friends and family of 
We went to one restaurant and Disney World is wonderful about having chefs come out and ask you, what are your allergies? How can we do this? And one of the restaurants we stopped at, a chef came out and said and was like, what do you want to eat? And I said, well, what can I what can I eat? These are my allergies. What on the menu is safe for me? And he just looks me dead in the eye and goes, no, what do you want to eat? And I'm just like, oh, I've literally never had this experience in my life. Um, and like ta- and like explaining that to people of like this thing that for me is such that other people take for granted of like you go to a restaurant and you get whatever you want to eat. And I'm like, no, I don't. I don't do that. Um, and so, wow, this, we have gone off on so many tangents in this conversation. It was a wonderful discussion. And I really appreciate it. I know. I'm, I'm but, enjoying it. <laughs> But yeah, of getting masks as that tool of letting me tell that story and kind of and explore those themes and ideas of this character where Highwire as a character, Celeste Thompson as a character, is not only her food allergies, but they do come up regularly. They have come up multiple times in doing stuff uh, from her first appearance to I wrote a script and did a thing for March Mat- Masksness one year that included uh, her her supervillain boyfriend who is an entire other aspect of Skywire's personality and character arc being like, oh, we can go to that allergy friendly bakery that I found a couple of years ago. And like that idea being a thing that can just come up and be part of that character and explore that idea of I get to tell this story that is based on aspects of my life that I have never seen in media and especially never seen in genre media because when it does come up in media it's like here's a YA novel that is entirely about navigating food allergies as a teenager and I'm like okay but I want to navigate food allergies as a teenager while also saving the world from robots let me do both Uh, (laughs) uh, and so yeah (laughs) Disneyland I'm sure is also wonderful with allergies because Disney World uh has legitimately made me cry about how wonderful they are with dealing with allergies because nowhere else is. <laughs> I would also have to argue, though, uh, and this is a uh, this has actually been a joke uh, with me and the people on Moon Harbor as well. Yes, uh, for Moon Harbor Heroes, I played the Blade of Sorrows and uh, another sad boy, uh, <laughs> and but a very flirty sad boy, uh, and. Uh, everybody is on the East Coast and I'm on the West Coast. And we constantly have the argument about is Disney World better than Disneyland? And I always have to tell them Disneyland is the far superior one. <laughs> and all of you are missing out on the West Coast. <laughs> or on the East Coast. You're all missing out on the East Coast. Excuse me. Yeah, everybody. Yeah, Disneyland, I think, is much, much better. Well, I have I have yet to be able to go. Uh, but I have heard. I know. I have only, I've only been to Disney World twice in my life and it's always a magical experience uh but <laughs> yeah no i am just yes someday someday when travel exists again and <laughs> the world is safe someday um <laughs> all of this is wonderful what were we talking about were we talking about i honestly don't even know uh, i'm actually trying to look at the <laughs> i was trying i was trying to peek at, at the <laughs> outline that you gave me as well which by the way like if if anything ever has jpg vibes uh it's definitely sending an outline uh so thank you for this and thank you for understanding how i am as a person they're they're good they're wonderful they're very helpful tools. <laughs> so speaking of looking back at this outline and speaking of young justice again and getting getting back to whatever this show is supposed to be about uh <laughs> since it is about we are consistently a show about seven million things but mainly young justice so speaking of young justice and i brought up ya novels again so let's talk about this for a second personally i one of my favorite things about the way young justice incorporates archetypes uh that thing that we're talking about today is that especially in season one, it relies so much more heavily on the archetypes of teen media and YA media in general, rather than strict like adult superhero archetypes because young justice has is, and was always meant to be a show that was about teenagers who happen to be superheroes. And so that kind of idea of like, if you look at, 
the original team as it was introduced. It's like you have Calder, who's kind of like the older, more put together teenager, who is the teenager who's kind of an adult. And you have Robin, who's the youngest member of the group and is kind of like the kid who's having fun with things. And you have Wally, who is the disaster trying to flirt with people and Superboy, who's like the broody loner guy and uh, Miss Martian, who's the girly girl and Artemis, who is the not girly girl uh, to break it down to its base components uh, of that (laughs) season one team. Because also I could talk for 10 million hours about the way Young Justice did the like, here's the two spectrums, uh, the two ends of the girl character spectrum, but also they're both more complicated than that. So thank you. And how... Just the idea of all of those characters are kind of introduced with those archetypes at the core of them more than like the superhero media archetypes of being like, well, who's the Superman of the group and who's the Batman of the group and who's the Wonder Woman of the group, which is what gets put on a lot of indie superhero media nowadays. Uh, It's like you're what famous Marvel or DC hero is your hero in an indie uh, superhero thing, whereas Young Justice, even though it's all about these characters who are not the like big famous DC characters mostly isn't trying to be like, and this kid is just baby Batman or this kid is just baby Superman. Even though two of these kids are that that's not what matters. What matters is where they fit into those things that come up from stuff like the breakfast club and teen movies from many decades of teen media And I find that interesting. Do you have thoughts on this, JPG, before I ramble more? Oh, no. I I definitely have thoughts. I was hoping for more. I was hoping for more talk from you. I would not call that (laughs) rambling, by the way. And plus, who listens to a podcast and doesn't expect rambling? Fair. Right? Like... (laughs) Okay, so uh, one of the things that I want to bring up is... um, Oh, you're going to hate me for this, and I'm so sorry for this, Emily. Okay. Um, I hate... 80s teen films i totally feel you there are major problems with them uh i totally don't want to there are certain things i like from certain eras of teen films and it's more like there are bits and pieces and conceptually things that i like from certain ones also the breakfast club of of that kind of era the breakfast club is basically the only one i've seen that and like maybe one or two other ones because I've heard so many things about like, yeah, no, yeah. don't watch this one, this one, this one, or this one because of long list of problems. I don't rem- I don't recommend pretty in pink. I've heard. That's <laughs> so for me, when I, whenever I look at, uh, whenever I look at teen media, right. I, my brain always starts in the nineties. Uh, mostly yes. because that's when I remember all of that stuff. And and so, okay, so, oh God, I have a terrible, I have, I have like a terrible dichotomy for this because like on the one hand is Power Rangers, right? It's all of these cool kids who are getting good grades and are volunteering <laughs> and then also su- <laughs> All these kids <laughs> who are all- getting good grades. <laughs> you have to understand how much I loved the Power Rangers. But I just unlike, love that I wish, being the pitch yeah. for Power Rangers. Oh yeah, no. They're good all- kids getting good grades and saving the world. <laughs> Here's the thing. They were all pitched as teenagers with attitude, but did they really have attitude? Did they re- or or was it a positive can do attitude <laughs> that we were actually talking about? Because when you say teenagers with attitude, I expect something very specific, not Oh, we're going to use our time to volunteer at the smoothie bar in order to teach children martial arts. <laughs> Please tell me you've ever you've seen any Power Rangers. Please tell me. Yes, I have. I have an older okay. brother. I have seen Power Rangers. No, no, no. But like, but there are like different seasons of Power Rangers. I'm very specific when it comes to this. I know. Okay. I've seen. I've seen bits and pieces of some Power Rangers. I couldn't tell you which ones. I know there are differences. I know there are important differences to to the people who care about the Power Rangers. <laughs> I would never belittle that, but I also know that I couldn't tell you what the differences are. I know some of them have dinosaurs. I know some of them have dinosaurs and some of them are in space. Uh, I know those broad strokes. Uh, (laughs) This hurts my feelings so much, Emily. (laughs) I'm so sorry. It's okay. It's okay. With with a... um, With Power Rangers, right? That's like, that's one end of the spectrum. It's this idealized version of of teenagers and how and how adults want them to act 
at this point, right? Which, and there are merits to that, right? There, there are merits to, okay, this is the idealized version. It's why a lot of people love Superman, right? Because there is, there, there is merit in the idealism, even if you're just trying to aim for that idealism, yes. right? Yes. But we have the other side of the spectrum, and, and people are going to be a little bit shocked when I mention something like this too, or I personally feel like this is the other side of the spectrum, but it's Saved by the Bell. Okay. Uh, and if you've never seen Saved by the Bell, uh, uh, first off, I'm very sorry that your that your life is like this. Uh, but <laughs> Saved by the Bell is basically it happens in Bayside High, which is like this actual like weird like rich kid school, <laughs> and then um, it's like this like group of people um, who are like friends, but they all shouldn't be friends because there's like somebody super preppy and popular there's a jock who got there on a scholarship there's the super smart girl there's a super nerdy guy cheerleader best friend fashionista all that stuff right yeah. they have it's all these w- weird archetypes and they're it's all it's one of those friend groups on tv where you're like how do you even know each other how did you guys yep. meet <laughs> but i would say shows like saved by the by the bell were really the ones who really started that whole hey we're gonna have a 30 minute special to talk about drugs yeah. but then never actually talk about a drug in general yeah uh, there's, a, there's a very famous episode for saved by the bell where uh jesse who is the smart girl starts taking caffeine pills yes i have heard i have i have heard and seen <laughs> these clips it, it is it is very bad the right? concept of the very special episode is an adventure of 80s and 90s sitcoms. Yes, yeah. Yeah, we don't we don't really get the the full cheese of sitcoms anymore. Um but we are also in a very specific point in sitcoms now, but I feel like that's going to be for another podcast. <laughs> That's for the WandaVision podcast that I start someday out of sheer love and desperation. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, you were saying about Saved by the Bell. Um, oh, yes. Sorry. Uh, Save, Save by the Bell, right? That's the other side of it, right? Where you, where it's not really, I wouldn't call it the idealism. I, um, because that's, you know, the idealism of Power Rangers is that you always do the right thing. Yeah. As opposed to the other side of this is all these kids Kind of just get away with stuff. Yes. Saved by the Bell is full of people doing awful things and facing no consequences because they're just co- yes. too cool for that. Uh, please, please, please. There's a there's a series. I think it's on Funny or Die. That's called Zach, Zach Morris. Zach Morris is, is trash. trash. Yeah. I have watched. Uh, this yes. is part of how I know anything about Saved by the Bell is by watching Zach Morris is trash. Uh, and I think the best thing about Zach Morris is trash is that they don't exaggerate what happened on the episode itself. It's just that these people are trash and he's always going to get away with it, right? Yes. Now, I would also say that Mark Paul Gossler, who plays Zach Morris, uh, who played Zach Morris on the show, um, he was very, uh, he's like their biggest fan. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I'm glad that he was so gracious about the, the I guess like the, the breakdown of the show in general, yeah. you know? Um, but, but yeah, so I, th- I guess my point is, is that there's, <sighs> I think that there's always room for idealism, right? Al- although it might feel sort of fantasy-ish, I think there is always going to be room for that sort of idealism. I do want to call out Power Rangers for one thing though. Okay. Um, in canon, they have never, uh, they've only had one Red Ranger who is a girl. And they've only had one Red Ranger who is an Asian male. Yeah. yeah. Both of them, though, didn't get a lot of screen time. Oh, technically, I'm sorry. They had two They had two female Red Rangers. Um, so uh, it was... Oh, my gosh. So one was in Power Rangers SPD. And the other one was in Power Rangers... There was like a samurai one for Power Rangers as well. They were... One was mentioned to be a Red Ranger and then never showed up. <laughs> Um, and then they were like evil or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> and then the other one was, um, it was her brother that was a Red Ranger first, but she was the original. And then it went back to her brother, which is dumb. Yeah. And, and then for, uh, and then for the Asian male, it was, uh, the Red Ranger on Hyperforce, which I, was, I like will a smile and nod as Twitch. if those, uh, yeah. I will smile and nod as if these <laughs> names mean, mean more to me. Um, but what I will say for anyone 
who has even less Power Rangers knowledge than I do, I will point out that some people might be like, well, why does that matter? There have been female Power Rangers and there have been diverse Power Rangers. But the thing is, the reason I I will know why this is important, I will show my one bit of Power Rangers knowledge, is because the Red Ranger is always in charge. So it's important that the Red Ranger is not always just a white boy uh, because he's the leader. They're the leader. And it's important. I I know one thing about Power Rangers. (laughs) <laughs> you know of course they're playing off of archetypes as well i would say that if i would start you if if i could give you any <laughs> couple of power ranger seasons to watch um it would be uh oh my gosh there's the car one why oh power rangers rpm uh because this was the last year that disney had power rangers and they're like screw it do whatever you want with this particular show. And then the writers did and then saved all of Power Rangers, which was incredible. Uh, And then the other one would be Power Rangers Time Force because the Red Ranger is there, but really it's the Pink Ranger who is always traditionally a woman that is the actual leader for that one. Nice. We like we like we like subverting expectations when it comes. Yes, to archetypes. subverting archetypes is always going to be fun. Yes, because as we've been to- as we've been talking about archetypes, the main thing we've been talking about this episode. Um, speaking of that, it's one of those things that I think Young Justice does really well with all these characters, as we've talked about the way that they grow and everything like that. But even like the who's the leader archetype thing, the show plays with the idea that everyone going in goes Robin's the leader. Because Robin's always the leader. Because Teen Titans, like, we know who's the leader. It's always Robin. And the show goes, Robin is 13 and trying real hard, but he's still 13. Also Also an idiot. Because at 13, every 13-year-old is an idiot. I'm sorry. It's it's just, yeah. He's an adorable, chaotic force uh, that is trying real hard. And the show presents the idea of you expect going into any teen superhero thing that Robin will be the leader. And the show says, no, in this team makeup, that doesn't make any sense. And the leader should be someone else. But it it still acknowledges why the viewer would assume that Robin should be the leader and presents good reasons why he's not. And it those archetypes are helpful for this story because it presents it as like, Robin assumes he's going to be leader just because he's been doing this the longest, even though he's the youngest one in the team. And the show goes out of its way to tell him, and by extension, us, the audience, why that's not the right fit for this makeup of the team and how Calder, while he maybe hasn't done this as long, is older and wiser and has a different set of training that makes him a better fit for this, while still acknowledging within the story of the show that like you as the viewer are not stupid or wrong for assuming that Robin would be the leader. You're not, we're not pulling the rug out from under you just to pull the rug out from under you. We are giving you reasons in this story why these things make sense in a different setting than you may be used to. It, it also treats the audience to the progression. Yes. Right? Because, you know, um, I got it. I, I say this on almost every podcast I'm on, and I don't know why, but I I love a good time jump. I love a good time jump, and that time jump in between first and second season, it establishes people into different archetypes. But now, as an audience, we get to see this reverse engineered. Yeah. Through yeah. through hints and stories, and and uh, I don't know. I I love the idea that. As an audience, we have to figure it out with each other instead of it just being a little bit spoon fed to us, kind of like how it was in the first season. But of course, you know, we also have to remember that this is a that this the show's demographic is for children as well. So there needs to be a little bit of spoon feeding. That's why I always tell people, you know, the first season of any cartoon that anybody's going to love is going to be directed a little bit more childish, uh, childishly. Um, I would say that this happens for Young Justice a bit. I'd say this happens for Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh, gosh. Uh, She-Ra does it a little bit as well, but she was also ahead of its time, just like Steven Universe. Uh, but but Steven Universe's first season, I mean, it's a lot of fans didn't appreciate it as much as every other season. And to be quite honest, I think they're kind of right. <laughs> I, I feel 
bad saying that I would not know. I was Steven Universe kind of passed by me in the in the many oh. cartoons of the world. Uh, I never watched. I just I had friends who watched it, so I heard a lot about it, and I've picked up some of the lore over the years. But I never have technically sat down and watched it, even though many people tell me it's very good. Oh, um, you'd love it, and they're only like ten minute episodes too. So. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah, definitely. The every single season of Young Justice has characters with different archetypes to put in our buzzword for today, but also has a different vibe and has a different energy to it that works. Many people know that I didn't I contrast to you did not love the time skip between seasons, but also I was 13 and loved these characters as they were and wanted to see them grow up and wanted to see them be teenagers. And I wanted a superhero prom with every atom of my body. Um, and, <laughs> and instead we cut to everybody's 20 now. And you're like, Oh, I'll adjust. I'm, I'm sad, but I'll adjust. But looking back on it now as an adult with three seasons of this show under my belt, like it works and it's interesting and it's good. And it allowed them to do, big interesting things with these stories and how these characters developed in a way that telling all of those stories in order might not have allowed for the same progression for in as condensed a time uh because that five-year jump would have been five more seasons of trying to get these characters to somewhere new but yeah those time skips allow for such drastic character development that still feels natural because mm-hmm. this show was planned so much. They, the, creators, <laughs> the creators talk about how much stuff is just planned across like large events across this show, across timelines, backwards and forwards uh, in ridiculous amount of things where you're like, you probably haven't thought about this thing. And they're like, no, we have. We know. We know exactly when that happened in the timeline. Uh, and we're like, okay. But that level of planning that went into this show and went into kind of the basic prep work for this show allows for those kind of drastic changes and drastic Mm -hmm. changes in archetypes because it's they did not sit down and write Superboy as a this brooding loner guy and then naturally kind of stumble into oh wait he's actually this really kind sensitive caring caregiver character over time they sat down and were like Here's how he starts. Here's where he's going to be eventually. Here's how he's going to be eventually after that. And filled in the details between those larger setups for this character. And those small details allow for that transition into season two that you see in wonderful, wonderful ways. Um, Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Just everywhere. Just this. We're just going to talk about everything about Young Justice today. (laughs) Like, because I think one of the things I will bring this up and you may have some thoughts on this is I love the way that this that Young Justice presents archetypes that when left unexplored can be kind for lack of a better word, kind of problematic um, just because they present one dimensional characters who aren't interesting and who may have some just not great things associated with them. So like that I that idea with Connor of presenting him as the loner guy, there are a, there's a lot of baggage attached to that idea of like the cool the cool attractive guy is the one who doesn't get along with anyone and would punch a hole in a wall and that's not great. And the show over time goes out of its way to go, yeah, those things about Connor aren't great and he has to unlearn those things and grow as a person and like there is a breakdown of like the entire concept of toxic masculinity early in season one in not that many words, but when he deals with Black Canary and she's like, no, you need to you need to calm down and figure out why you're so mad and put that somewhere and figure out what you're doing and learn to trust and appreciate other people. And he does and grows into a wonderful three dimensional character over time because of that. Oh, we see him also like with the juxtaposition with him and Cyborg in the third season. Yeah. Right. You know, like it's not an accident that we get that particular Cyborg while Superboy has made this progression. We see that, you know, uh, Superboy experiences Cyborg's anger 
not in a way where he's like, get over it. He's like, no, I know exactly where you are coming from at that point. But yes. So much of season three of Superboy of Connor interacting with any of the young men joining the team in season three is like, hi, I've been where you are. I know why you're so mad. Let's work through that for a second. Let's... And how so many of the characters do that for other characters as the show goes on allows for really interesting explorations of those tropes and of those archetypes, buzzword, of like Artemis being the one who kind of takes uh, both Tara and Halo under her wing and is like, Mm -hmm. I know what it's like to be the one no one trusts or the one who has connections to villainy in my past. And while both Halo and Tara are very different characters from who Artemis is. They have that bit of that archetype sprinkled into them. And it allows for those interactions of her being, of her just saying, I understand where you're coming from, but I'm however many years older at this point, and I can give you perspective on that in a way that shows that don't do giant time skips and don't have 10 million characters like this can't do. Um, <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much for spending some time with us here in the Watchtower JPG. Where can people find you here on Earth Prime? Uh, So uh, you can find me on social media. My main product is within Quest of Geek. uh, And we, oh gosh, I'm just forgetting our tagline now too. It's guiding your next pop uh, pop culture journey. We are in Quest of Geek. And uh, you can find us at in Quest of Geek. And you can find me personally at JPG. That's J-A-E-P-E-A-G-E-E. Uh, I'm on a couple other Masks podcasts. Uh, one is Nerds on a Roll, and that's going to be under at N-O-A-R underscore podcast. And uh, then we also have uh, Moon Harbor Heroes, which is at Moon Harbor Cast. Wonderful. And if you're on 10 million more uh, Masks podcasts, by the time this comes out, I'm sure people will find them on social media. Oh, we'll just link it. Don't worry. (laughs) Thank you to everyone for spending some time with us today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at The YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at TheYJFiles.tumblr.com, and on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, and iHeartRadio, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if that somehow isn't enough for you, you can also email us at whelmedpodcast at gmail.com. If you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help other people find the show. And if you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S., since we have to look a little harder to find those ones. If you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And as always, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed. Well.